Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. Today on Tomes of Magic, we're going to be talking about the Euthanatos, a group of mages that have caused some controversy in the past. They assassinate both sleepers and mages. They engage in necromancy. They claim to be the only group qualified to police the other traditions in the Council of Nine, and our listeners are probably thinking, what is controversial about that? Well, we'll get into it today. But before we do, I just want to ask uh, my co-host, Terry Robinson, how are you doing, and do you have any announcements for us? Pronounce a word. <laughs> yeah, that is, I, I must admit, that is an issue with me to this day. I am going to try to pronounce Euthanatos uh, like other mage fans uh, for this episode. But if I slip up, um, well, I'm probably going to have some penance to do. But the real answer is, it's a made-up word. Who cares? People should live their lives. So <laughs> I remember early on, I was talking with another podcaster. We were comparing notes on audience feedback, and they're like, yeah, our community is pretty great. I'm like, I think our community is pretty great, too. Occasionally, though, they really pounce on you. And the other person was like, did you mispronounce a word? And I'm like, yeah. And he just looks at me and goes, they're vicious about that. <laughs> so... But as far as announcements go, this episode should go out shortly before TriatCon. And if you're not familiar, TriatCon is my attempt at putting together a small online convention with the intent of getting people to try games. Uh, more information is available at triatcon.com. And that's all I have to announce. Back to you, Adam. Well, today on Tomes of Magic, we are looking at Euthanatos Tradition Book Revised, uh, which, of course, comes out during Revised Edition. It is 100 pages. It was written by Malcolm Shepard. It came out in 2002. And because this is a Malcolm Shepard book, it uses small typeface. So <laughs> the 100 pages is actually rather deceptive. It's a lot longer than the 100 pages would make you think. And so today on the show, we have a lot of meat on the bone. And uh, some of you may be thinking that's a rather macabre expression, but we're talking about the euthanatos, so the macabre is not off limits today. So the book opens with a prelude, and boy howdy, does this get things going. It is entitled Walking on Knives, and just a general content warning that the frame narrative of this book involves a person who was recently killed for filming and doing inappropriate things with children. We're not going to get into the details on it, but that's kind of the undercurrent the entire time. Someone's avatar in the book is referred to as the baby skull. Two Euthanatos members bust in, are ready to deliver the, the good death, find out that the person is married. They grab a bunch of the kids to, to liberate them from this condition. They grab the wife without killing her, even though one thinks she's accomplice and the other one thinks she's salvageable. The gun is pointed at a person's head, and one character says, you're going back to the unmaking, Jim. You're going to have a new life, new chances. Don't take the evil with you. Keep this death in your heart. Take this lesson into your eternal soul. I'm sorry, he says, but you're not. The character responds, bang, bang, bang. And that bang, bang, bang was not added by me. It was in the text. And you're like, okay. Th mm. They take the pedal off the gas for the next section, the introduction, which is entitled Drinking from the Skull. The theme stated in the book is renewal in the face of destruction. That the starting of the sixth great maelstrom may have suggested that the cycle of creation isn't as eternal as people thought it was. One of the recurring themes in the book is that we are in the sixth age, the age of iron, where Kali will once again dance across the, the Tellurian. And the Avatar storm and the sixth great maelstrom has people going, oh, uh, I thought we had more time, maybe not. That the Euthanatos have the option of doubling down on trying to cleanse the mortal world, which they don't quite have the tools to, or completely ignoring it and almost becoming Akashic in terms of their remove from what is happening. The mood is outrage, detachment, and jor. That emotion clouds judgment, but ignoring emotion can cause callousness, and failure to find a way to deal with it can cause jor. And one of the recurring themes is we are a group that does what other people would call horrible. How how do we deal with that emotionally without it getting to us? And the answer is, is hard. The big thing it starts here is it gives us a definition of the wheel. The, the great cycle of birth, death, and reincarnation used as a metaphor for creation and the living world. And one of the key things that occurs in this book, in my opinion, is the shift of the wheel being a literal thing to being a way of viewing the world. 
I very much appreciated that. I thought it was important. Um, other words that we get that are going to be super important later, Chidona, the belief system and legal code derived from the eight-spoked wheel of the law. And it is the binding set of practices that kind of unite the euthanatos. The word Kwamatha, which literally means crossroad, which is kind of like an epiphany or a moment of great choice. And each one of them is given a name. For instance, the white Kwamatha sparked the Himalayan war. Well, my only thought on the introduction was I was pleased that with this lexicon, uh, when I was reading later chapters in the book, I wanted to look up a word, I turned to the lexicon, and it was there. And so this is a helpful, useful lexicon. Chapter one is entitled History is a Tightening Noose, and it follows the characters Truce and Evelyn, along with Janine, the wife of the formerly alive uh, child bad things doer and three of the kids as they are trying to make their clean escape and get to a chorister chantry that will take the kids and this is a blend of dealing with the police keeping the kids from freaking out uh, and it made me realize that like oh man being a mage parent must be great when you have access to mind magic if you're comfortable brainwashing your kids <laughs> so in one case when the Ali Batine are like brainwashing initiatives you're like that's wrong and in another case they're like oh man you could keep a kid on a car ride quiet the entire time I'm like this is perfectly reasonable it starts with the the ancient history of the group and it, it claims that the universe began as a void that cried out in loneliness and the first sounds became the first denizens of the universe that these first entities though kind of clogged things up and prevented new things from existing so either those entities sacrificed themselves or some entities yet to be killed them to make space for what would come later the initial sound was not only all that had happened but all that ever would happen and this chapter starts laying out the philosophical differences between probably the next closest group, the Akashiyana. They say that even in those first moments, the idea of, of fate had been created. The first beings to exist interfered with the wheel, and they would not allow it to progress and had to be destroyed to let new things exist. And within this cosmogony, the new beings that were created after the fall of the first ones were still quite powerful, and they were so strong that they couldn't intertwine with each other to create fate. All beings but death fought to not be destroyed. Death broke up the other gods and draws all things into it, which is why entropy is biased towards destruction and not necessarily towards balance. It then goes into mortal history and talks about the uh, Indian subcontinent that along the Ganges, there were groups who would nudge the course of nature as needed, who were invaded by the Aryans, who were a bit more brutal and brought along with them personalized gods. At the same time, in sub-Saharan Africa, the Mad Zimbabwe was also reading the skein of fate. Eventually, the Himalaya Wars occur because the Akashiana has avoided death. And I liked this as an idea, that one of the reasons that the Himalayan War started was that the Akashic Masters had become uh, so perfect in body that they could no longer die. And the Euthanatos are like, nope, not okay. It kind of skipped the whole, like, you killed a guy to stop a plague from spreading, or the Akashiana version of, you killed a guy and then smiled a lot. And it also suggests that this... One, this period is very hard to research because during the war, people set up large barriers against scrying to prevent their enemies from knowing their strategies, and that has persisted in some way. But also, there are a lot of very embarrassed people who maybe have set up wards who don't want to look through that time, and I thought that was a good justification and story of why we don't have more information on this period. It, it totally makes sense. Alexander eventually takes India and the Greek mages that had joined him sense a kinship with the mages of the Indian subcontinent who worship the Chthonic gods like the Arrhenes. And as history progresses forward near the fall of Byzantium, the Golden Chalice tries to keep society healthy by mixing Chthonic worship and alchemy to cut away the decadence of Byzantium. And we find out that this group may eventually help seed one of the groups that will ultimately join the technocracy. The Red Kolmatha occurs in 1304 as a number of groups unite to form kind of a early version of the Euthanatos and picks up a bunch of people that had kind of been rejected from the other traditions. Uh, we also get our first kind of metaplot bomb drop that 
part of this Byzantine group, the Golden Chalice, would eventually become the Caserify, who joined the technocracy after they had learned all they could. They later leave and become the Janissaries of House Hermes, and the Euthanatoi have found this out, that the Janissaries were uh, formerly members of the Order of Reason, and kind of have performed a purge. Historically, the Janissaries have acted as internal police for the traditions, and now it could be the Euthanatoi. But they need to do two things. One, finish the purge of the Janissaries, or Jassassins, if you prefer their mocking term that was listed in the Order of Hermes book. And also, they need to convince the other traditions that this is something that they should be allowed to do. As history continues, we learn about the Thugi cults who are fighting back against Western imperialism um, and, and some of the various representations of people who are uh, a bit more direct in their perceived service to Kali. With World War One, everyone kind of gets more callous, and the Euthanatos kind of look at this and go, once you can kill people at a distance without any repercussions to you, there is a karmic disconnect that is going to start causing problems. And then we get another plot drop, where after World War Two, when the uh, nodes that the Nefandi had been using are being divided up. Um, the node at the Dachau concentration camp, they're trying to figure out what to do with it, and they assign it to the consequentity of eternal joy. The consequentity of eternal joy is the group that is headed by Vormas, the grand harvester of souls. The original thought was that giving it to them would mean a non-Western hand had it, as well as a group of people used to dealing with death taint. That turned out to be a, a poor choice that sets into motion a, a plot thread that uh, may eventually destroy the Tellurian. We'll see later. The group is then upended by the discovery of what Vormas, Grand Harvester of Souls, has been doing when the House of Helicar, which is the Chantry located on Kerberos, rotating Pluto, is found to be gone after having spent about a decade going around and picking up tasks from tainted nodes and doing all sorts of bad things. This is unearthed by Mark Gillen. The Euthanatos are embarrassed by this and do kind of an internal purge and try and track down as many members of the consanguinity as they can with limited success. The Hermetics are embarrassed because they have been uh, keeping this under wraps. And kind of the start of the modern meta plot of Mage more or less begins with tracking down the members of the consanguinity and, and dealing with the repercussions. The The last major meta plot event that we get is when Zapathosora awakens in Bangladesh during the week of nightmares. The Euthanatos are very active in the Indian subcontinent. They are heavily affected by it. A number of mages are, are lost during the fight against this entity in an attempt to protect mortals. They marvel at the technocracy's willingness to just kill people, and they marvel at it in two ways. One, it's amazing that they would do this, and two, it's amazing that they could do it, and it was somewhat successful when you're willing to drop three neutron bombs to stop a rising antediluvian. It does have its upsides. They also note that in the process of this, one of the groups that had been guarding a tainted node in the area, the node was cleansed, and this is now one of the few places where you can go into the Umbra without having to deal with the Avatar Storm. So again, you have a interesting option that if you want to play with a post-reckoning meta plot. Uh, there, there are places where the Avatar Storm is not a problem. We get a section on relations. They call out the hypocrisy of the shapeshifters, which I appreciate where they're like, okay, so you're trying to put down the embodiment of entropy, which you call the worm. How are you doing that? By killing a whole bunch of people. Yep, what could possibly go wrong? You want to make the world less killy by killing people. Good, good luck with that. They also make their obligatory mention to either hunter or mummy. In this case, it is hunters. They say that they generally try to avoid killing them because the Chidona forbids extraneous killing. And that since they are largely immune to magic, you are forced to use mundane means to, to outwit them. Throughout the section, there are also little bits about the various gods and belief systems that the group embraces. And one of the things the chapter does, it specifically says that the group is synthetic and combining kind of disparate beliefs, which I liked, in my opinion, in Mage, almost all groups are in some way synthetic, and that's what makes it kind of cool. But we, we woven in our notes about the, uh, the Moragu, Persephone, the Hakacha, Kali, and so on, and how to use them 
in the game. The final note I have on this section is it includes a little note, our obligatory mummy reference in the form of the Shimsu Heru guarding the underworld in Egypt. And it is impossible to do an Agama sojourn in Egypt. And I'm like, that's cool. I don't think it'll literally ever come up, but that's cool. That's, that's chapter one. It was a lot of stuff. I have to concur. Chapter one covered a lot of ground, uh, a lot, a lot of interesting material here. Uh, if your goal is to fuse Greek, Celtic, African, or Sub-Saharan African, and Hindu cultures together, chapter one is a, is a clever way to do it. Uh, this was attempted in the first Euthanatos tradition book. I, I wasn't quite satisfied with the result, but the result is is much more artfully done here. So I certainly appreciated that. On around page nineteen, we start talking about uh, the. Himalayan War, which is um, uh, talked about a lot uh, throughout the uh, early editions of Mage. This book gave a really good insight into why the Euthanatos would initiate that conflict. Uh, In the past, um, one of the reasons I was not really very enthusiastic about the Himalayan War is I, I couldn't get a clear sense of why these two groups would initiate and continue this conflict. For the first time, this book gives me actually a a very clever and very reasonable idea for why the Euthanatos would do that. And that is basically, it doesn't go into great detail here, but it lets us know that the Euthanatos at that time in the Indian subcontinent, they were uh, using their magic to try and find out what does the universe want us to, to do, what is going to happen in the future, and how should we adjust to that. And the idea comes through that you need to initiate this conflict. And... So they obeyed uh, because that is a big part of their practice. And then in later years, they found out that, hey, one, it brings us together as a group. And two, uh, as the group called the Euthanatos in later years. And two, it is going to help us make contact with outside mages so that we can be a part of the Council of Nine, which will be important to us in the future. And so I was reading through that. It's like, okay, for fate mages who are always trying to, you know, determine the future as best they can and listen to the will of the universe, to, to paraphrase, this makes sense. This is compelling. And so I really appreciated finally getting a a justification for that. But unfortunately, I still do not have a satisfying answer for how the Akashayana or Akashic Brotherhood could engage in the Himalayan War. Um, Even with the uh, recent uh, tradition book revised for Akashic Brotherhood that we read, I still don't have a satisfying answer for that. Their, Their beliefs and their practices are not about conflict and warfare and killing off enemies, but still they dove headfirst into this Himalayan war and stayed in it. And so I don't really have a satisfying answer for that, but perhaps I'm, I'm one of the few who uh, is concerned about that issue. In the timeline, it gives us very good reasons why, a timeline is a sidebar in chapter one, but it gives us very good reasons why we don't know much about the Himalayan war. Um, you know, Terry mentioned those a moment ago, but they made sense. And it's like, okay, I understand this. I understand why there's so much that is unknown about this time period, you know, four mages in the mage setting. But then it immediately goes into a great degree of detail about what happened in the Himalayan War. And so I, I, that didn't sit well with me. It's like, okay, I understand why not much is known. And uh, this gives story- storytellers in their own chronicles uh, the ability to, to work out what details are going to be important for their chronicle, but then don't immediately dive into a, whole, a great level of, of detail. That, that doesn't quite fit together for me. On, on page 22, the in-character fiction, there was a, a character, I believe she's named Janine, and she was the accomplice to the, the terrible villain, and so the two Euthanatos uh, pick her up. They decide, okay, we're not going to kill her. We're going to take her with us as we uh, flee the scene because the cops are going to come. And so this uh, Janine character, they, they push her into something called the Agamate, if, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this is a near-death experience that is an initiation into being a Euthanatos mage. Uh, they push her into it, and then when she comes out, they say, hey, you're, you're one of us now, and, and you can begin learning about how to be one of us. This, I've, I've said this in, in a past episode, but I think the Agamate is much more meaningful when it is voluntarily entered into instead of someone coming out of a car crash and just you know coming off of uh, coming out of a coma and they're saying hey you're a, you're a euthanatos mage you, you passed all of our entry requirements and the mage is saying i didn't know anything about that but okay fine i think it's it's much more mystically important when the initiate knows what they're about to do and agrees to do it and then goes through with it it's, it's a much more meaningful thing for me uh, there are numerous sidebars in chapter one. 
that gives us a, a snapshot of these other cultures that are a part of the Athanatos, the, the Greeks, the, the Celtics, the sub-Saharan Africans. And these sidebars really bring us a lot of detail that we have never seen in published mage books up to this point. It really helps these other cultures, the non-Indian cultures, to, to come alive for me and give me hooks as a storyteller for how to portray NPCs from those groups. So I appreciated that. And uh, towards the end of the chapter, we have the section on other creatures of the world of darkness. This is where we get the euthanatos opinions of hunters, vampires, werewolves, etc. This is an obligatory part of every tradition book, old and new. They are quite often uh, phoned in, uh, which is an expression meaning um, they, they just give the bare minimum, saying, oh, yeah, uh, werewolves, they're scary. Oh, yeah, vampires, we don't like them. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But in this book, uh, this section is a cut above. We, we really get some meaningful uh, insights and opinions on what the Euthanatos think about these other groups. Uh, for the first time that I know of in a mage book, uh, it not only says, yeah, hunters, we know they're there, but it actually says what they think about hunters and how they are actually interacting with them now that they realize this group is out there and, and, and making waves. And so, yeah, this, this other creature section was a cut above. I, I wish other tradition books could give us a, a section like this one. But that wraps up my thoughts on Chapter 1. Chapter 2 is entitled Ascension's Knife, and it starts with the introduction of Theora Heterk, who is the Herald of Senex. And this is interesting because it completely bucks this trend throughout the rest of Revised, uh, which more or less says the only people that have anything good to say are the new kids. And it's like, guess what? This 500-year-old guy, he's got a plan. So Senex takes over the Shade Realm of Entropy after the uh, fall of Duizatep. It is also suggested that Senex is still active. He took over control from the council, who was like, ah, Helicar is gone. What do we do? And the council's like, okay, I guess we take over it. And then everything lights on fire, and Senex is like, uh, how about I take care of it? And everyone's like, yeah, you do that. Senex thinks that it is possible to kind of do a grand cleansing of reality um, without kind of destroying it. Evelyn thinks it's stupid. Truce doesn't. Truce points out the red star, and he's like, there's a big star in the sky. And it may kill us all. And everyone's like, hmm, you may have a point. They talk about that most members experience for initiation some sort of near-death experience. And the impression I got from this is that a member will awaken during a near-death experience. They will have some sort of apprenticeship. And then they may experience this diksha, this other near-death experience, once they kind of get some... Uh, death under their belt, for lack of a better term. Or they're like, well, you accidentally nearly died last time. Let's have you nearly die on purpose this time. And they'll be like, ah, oh, death makes more sense now. So you have the Shravaka that start out as apprentices. The uh, the Chela serve under a mentor and they can administer the good death. The Akarya are the free agents that are kind of allowed to do what they do. If they decide to teach other people, they are known as gurus. You have the Padma Guru, who are the Archmages, they mention Senex and Vormas as the two that are running around out there. That justice is often done in consultation with the Chidona, the rules of the group, and that uh, when disagreements arise, formal adjudication occurs when each party picks an advocate that is a level above them. And I thought that was kind of interesting because if it's like an apprentice versus a master, that ultimately results in like an adept versus an archmage. And uh, that feels a little bit unbalanced to me, but okay. And then it starts going through the groups. They, they talk about how relatively informal the justice system is and how they tend to have somewhat democratic decision making. But it, it mentions that this is not constant across all of the groups. And then we get our big old section on the groups. Adam, can you tell us about who's in the Euthanatos? So here we go, the internal groups of the Euthanatos. The author uses the term faction to mean a larger group, usually from a specific culture that holds multiple smaller groups inside of it called sects. Sects correspond to, say, a House of the Order of Hermes or a methodology in a convention of the technocracy. So we start off uh, with the faction, Chakravanti. Uh, in the first tradition book, this was an alternative name for the Euthanatos, but also spe more specifically meant people Euthanatos from India. And here it is an actual faction, um, and it is uh, from India, and it holds three sects inside of it. The first of those is the Natatapas. I might be mispronouncing that. My apologies. Uh, this translates as 
holy dancers. Uh, this is the oldest sect of Euthanatos. Uh, the most conservative sect, members focus on merging with one or more Vedic gods and channeling their power. The second sect is the uh, Devasu. The Divine Arrow is the newest Euthanatos sect and formed in 1997 in, in the world of mage to replace the consanguinity of eternal joy, which was declared renegade. They do not watch for eternal threats like the consanguinity used to, but they do handle defense of the tradition through assassination and cursings. Uh, yogic discipline and martial arts are used to focus the power of Rudra, the Vedic archer. And finally, we have the Lakshmists, a modern-looking sect that reveres the goddess Lakshmi and focuses on probability. They use chaos, mathematics, computer technology, the digital web, and gambling in their arts. Many are seen as rogues since winning in casinos, stealing, and computer hacking are not off-limits uh, in the view of uh, members of this group. Next up, we have a larger faction called the Mad Zimbabwe. Uh, this was a sect in the first tradition book, but now are the faction from sub-Saharan Africa that holds two sects inside of it. They began in the city of Great Zimbabwe centuries ago. They operated as priests by day and witches by night, performing dark but necessary deeds. They place importance on guiding spirits of the dead to become benefactors for their living descendants. A small faction, but gaining new members now. The first sect inside the Med Zimbabwe is the Nanga, the older and more traditional sect uh, who are shamans that usually devote themselves to one or more ancestor spirit. They usually use the name Mad Zimbabwe for themselves. Uh, the second sect is the Takiti, Thanatoic uh, Vodunistas and Centurions uh, that are declining in recent years as members drift into the cult of ecstasy and the dream speakers. They call on ancestor spirits and meld with them. Many members see great differences with their beliefs and the more impersonal beliefs of other euthanatoi. Uh, next up we have the Hierokthonoi. I'm probably butchering that, my apologies. Uh, the term means priests of the earth. These Greek mages focused on the cycle of life and death by serving less known gods in caves and other secluded places. First off, the sect, the Pomegranate Dem, an amalgam of pre-Christian mystery cults that revere the triple goddess Persephone, Kore and Demeter, as well as Hecate and the Moire. That is the fates. Uh, many now see these gods more as metaphors or impersonal forces. A few learn the arts to turn themselves into a kind of mummy and give up their sphere knowledge to join a secret group called the Kabiri. Uh, the next sect is the Knights of Radamanthus, uh, beginning as judges within the Pomegranate Dem. In the Middle Ages, the knights became protectors of both Greek and Persian death mages. At the Grand Convocation of the Council of Nine, the knights got their modern name and accepted a role in the Ascension War. Still today, they are paid in tasks by the Council of Nine, to fight when needed. Having mixed with other traditions for centuries, they are more open and cosmopolitan in, in how they practice their arts. Uh, next up, we have a faction called the, the A-Dead, or the, the I-Dead. The term means death tale, as a tale is in story. These Celtic mages seem to focus more on supporting the wheel of the seasons rather than the wheel of uh, death and rebirth of human beings. They are strongest in Ireland and North America's Celtic diaspora. They believe all beings are bound by unique geisha that direct them to their destiny. Greater rewards of destiny are balanced by stricter geisha. Obeying the limits of geisha is proper, and those who break their own geisha may require punishment by the good death. Occasionally, a god will choose a talented person to accomplish their goals on earth. These people are free from destiny's limits but must obey the god. This grouping doesn't really have sects, but there are professions that members can specialize in or take up when occasion demands. The first profession is the death cranes, crane as in the bird. The Ideds killers most take on the art of the Morugu, uh, the Celtic triple goddess of war and death. They may enhance their mystic strength by accepting stricter geisha, but these eventually cause their doom. The second profession inside the Ided is the Philid. Uh, seers and practical wizards, when possible, they carry yew staffs or forked staffs as badges of office. Uh, weathercraft, animal husbandry, financial blessings, and protective spells are used to serve small communities. Next up, we have a faction called the Vrati. This is Sanskrit uh, language of the Indian subcontinent, uh, and it means directives. The three sects in this faction are entrusted with duties vital to the tradition and members must exhibit euthanatos ideals. With rare exceptions, these sects do not train apprentices, instead recruiting exceptional members of the tradition. Members of this group cannot be leaders and have less say in decision-making. In practice, these groups sometimes take decisive action on their own and cause controversy. First sect inside the Vrati is the Golden Chalice. Assassination specialists who originated in Byzantium, and they claim, ultimately, Troy. 
They employ alchemy and invoke the planetary powers. Some would see similarities to hermetic arts. They have made modern technology and skills part of their practice. They divide into the Alpha and Omega protocols. Alpha handles subtle missions such as infiltrating Nefandi groups or human uh, sleeper governments. They learn disguise, misdirection, and poisoning. The Omega handles marksmanship, demolitions, and wilderness skills. Omega specializes in hostage retrieval. Omega suffers from chronic lack of funds. A mysterious individual who wears a bronze mask has led the Golden Chalice for many years. Next sect is the Chakramuni. This is a new name for Scholars of the Wheel, which is a sect that has been inside the Euthanatos uh, for a few years in, in published mage books. They track the passage of avatars through their incarnations as mages, both inside and outside the tradition. They gain mystic insight, but also learn much about history and ancient threats to the tradition. They maintain a relationship with a similar group in the Akashic Brotherhood. And the last sect inside the Vrati is the Albareo. Uh, named after a star in the constellation Cygnus and represented by a swan, the only sect with no regional connection. They represent the tradition to the Council of Nine and are ambassadors to other traditions. Many are heralds. They secretly policed the traditions for internal threats. This secret was revealed when the House of Helicar's betrayal became public. Now there is debate if the Albareo should continue their policing of the traditions or agree to stop. Now we finish off with the others. This isn't really a group, it's a recognition that some sects don't belong to a larger group. These three sects are introduced in Guide to the Traditions. First up we have Yggdrasil's Keepers, the Gallowsmen Revere Odin, and the Beheaded Giant Mimir. They keep wisdom that can only be gained by dying and returning. They help people seek their destiny and prevent them from avoiding it. They believe fate is connected to battle, but have expanded the definition of battle to mean anything that stretches people to their limits and risks death. They study healing to help the brave return to battle. Many work with the Knights of Radamanthus as combat medics. We have the Palutino, a family of Italian mages descended from Etruscan priests. They practice magic lost to the rest of the world. They gain power from their ancestors and protect the graves of Italy's former rulers. They have amassed wealth and carefully arrange marriages with other European mystics to ensure they retain magical talent. They have their own customs and maintain a weak connection with the rest of the tradition. And we have the Yamsimo. The Lords of Death follow the Mayan death god Apuk. They allied with the Euthanatos at the Grand Convocation, but lost contact afterwards. Some Euthanatos mages go looking for them, but aren't successful. The Mayans sometimes approach other Euthanatoi with important information or knowledge of how to safely travel in Central America. Euthanatos leaders would like to know what's really going on. This examination of Euthanatos groups wouldn't be complete without mentioning the Naraki, or Naraki. The word translates to demons, but it means rogues, or barabi. Uh, in our recent episode on Cult of Ecstasy, Tradition Book Revised, we saw the cult recognizes harmful groups as still being cultists if they revere the Lakashim, the world pulse. The Euthanatos are different. They carry a heavy responsibility to the wheel and work to eliminate their groups that fall to corruption. There are three Naraki groups besides the consanguinity of eternal joy that we already saw in the Book of Chantries. We have the Nagaraja. Centuries ago, a group called the Idrin studied vampires to learn how they combined elements of death and life simultaneously. They developed the rote for becoming liches, as well as a reputation for crossing into the low umbra easily, enabling them to be feared killers. Continuing their obsession with death in life, they called themselves the Serpent Princes, Nagaraja, and became vampires. They became entangled in undead intrigues and faded from view. Most Euthanatos believe they are now gone, but fear the possibility that their mortal slaves are now at work somewhere. We have the Apad Dharma. This sect of Himalayan war Euthanatos resented others of their own tradition, tr trying to limit their defense of their homeland, eastern India, and their exploration of the extremes of antinomian tantra. Many revere Mara, a feared figure in Hinduism. Uh, many also accrue Jor intentionally while engaging in infernalism. And finally, we have the Visvadagni, or perhaps it's Visvadani. The all-consuming fire fell under the sway of demons pretending to be Vedic gods centuries ago. They believe the ultimate mercy is the destruction of the wheel itself so their gods can build a better universe. They have a sizable sleeper following. The cult leaders now know they serve demons, but think they'll be on top when the new universe is created. So this is a good point to add my thoughts on the factions inside the Euthanatos. The factions, that is the groups that contain sects, are arranged to emphasize the international nature of the tradition, but the Vrati don't fit this mold, and sects like the Knights of Radamanthus and the Lakshmists are pushed into cultures when they fit better on their own. I feel like it might limit players who want to be in those groups. 
I think respecting death is too vague a theme to hold these different cultures together, but revised edition repeatedly emphasizes political expediency, so the author uh, did his best to string things together, and did a very good job, I might add. When we get into the details of the non-Indian death mages, I see many large differences that weaken the idea that they all see common cause. The non-Indian groups are quietly pushed into the Chakravanti mold of hunting down mortal offenders. Uh, I tell the players in my games that they're Characters don't have to join internal groups of the tradition if they don't want to, but this book makes it look like it's probably necessary. Uh, so, Terry, what were your thoughts on the uh, factions and sects? So, the first thing that struck me is so the Chakravanti still use the Agama Sojourn. That seems like a real good way to lose a lot of apprentices real fast when the Avatar Storm is happening. That's just kind to me, which I understand why they're doing it. They're like, hey, this is the problem with sticking with tradition. I, I like that they mentioned that the Mad Zimbabwe and the Nagoma historically don't get along. They consider the Nagoma power grabbers. And I like seeing that mirror of that the, the quest for power is kind of universal across culture, prevents it from things falling into everything's great outside of the Western world. They kind of litter it with plot options. Like they mentioned that the top spot in the Hierokthenoi is open. Could that be your character? They also m mention how the Omega and the Alpha Protocol work within the Golden Chalice. And it's like the Omega Protocol is always wanting for money. I'm like, how? Everyone in your group probably has Entropy 1. You could just get a winning lottery ticket. It's not that hard. I understand that they're doing it for, for, for plot reasons, that they're like, oh yeah, by the way, you have to be super good and you have to do it on a shoestring budget, which I think is, is a neat uh, pressure to put on a character. I, I'm always thrown off by family groups. Like if Awakening is a 1 in 100,000 experience, how do you do that? And that raises a lot of mage questions. I kind of I kind of get it, but that there's always that tension there. I like that they mentioned that on the sorcery side that they tend to embrace those who have been shunned by other cultures for practicing things like hexes and necromancy. So I, I, I like the idea that the sorcerers that would work with the euthanatoi are a little bit more of a grab bag than just being like the mortal extension direct extension of what they're doing and it also introduces i think to mage the orphic circle which was this group that did a whole bunch of stuff it's kind of hard to summarize but the euthanatoi got word that there was this group of people that was doing uh, death stuff and every time they went to investigate the technocracy already cleared out whatever was happening there and removed all traces of what was going on. The Orphic Circle was behind Xerxes Jones, the technocrat who ignited one of the spirit nukes in the Well of the Void that eventually caused the Sixth Great Maelstrom. The actual events of the Week of Nightmares are surprisingly blurry, in my opinion, because you're like, wait, what order did this quite happen in? And in some cases, they say things happened at the same time, and in some cases, they didn't. Time of Thin Blood kind of gets it going, and then Guide to the Technocracy, of all places, kind of has that meta plot update, plus Bitter, uh, not Bitter Road, plus Tales of Magic Dark Adventure. So uh, if you're having trouble keeping track of what happened during the week of nightmares the best white wolf publication on this is actually the wiki which is not an official white wolf property and i'm uh, bound to say that by law uh, but if you're having difficulty following that we get it i do too and they don't really make mention except until we get to this book of the weird phenomenon that when the spirit nuke goes off it kind of throws a lot of souls that are in the underworld into the shroud some of them are pushed across and we get the walking dead and there are different types of these we get them in hunter we don't we never get a lot of detail about them in mage i think they do get to cheat on the question of so why is everyone stay together and you say well fate <laughs> it's kind it's kind of lazy but i'm like oh, i'm gonna allow it we get a very important sidebar on Jor. Whenever you use an effect to destroy a person's mind, body, or avatar, it may be incurred and that it manifests in the form of higher entropic resonance. You can also get it from doing things like torture or traveling excessively to the underworld or interacting too much with ghosts or just dwelling on death too much. It's introduced, we get a little bit more of a system that that recommends that the storyteller kind of reserve this for, for big moments and not make it quite a constant threat, um, but at least a constant concern. And then we get Thanatoic magic. And I thought this was beautifully done. It makes mention that if everyone could pierce the veil of reality, it would quite simply dissolve. And that the wheel is simply the manifestation of cause and effect. That 
paradox is the effect of not thinking through the consequences of what you're doing and more or less interfering with other things dharma that each entity has a path of fate that it is going to follow and paradox occurs when you use magic to interfere with those and i thought that was a interesting uh, explanation of what paradox is within their worldview and i thought that was pretty cool it goes through a whole bunch of focuses but some of the focuses it puts in a unique spin on them that i liked for instance bodies and bones represent not death necessarily but impermanence of course death is kind of a good manifestation of said impermanence as well as being a tool for whenever you want something to take on new forms that uh, they use the focuses common to whatever their participating group is. The Greeks are big on focusing on the elements that uh, sacrifice is powerful because it binds the god to the mortal, that it's a two-way thing that the word sacrifice means to make sacred, and that weapons are not just a sign of violence, but they are a sign of intent. The sword shows that you have an interest in defending or causing harm. And I thought those were good twists on it. Their magic used to revolve around one or two permanent powers and that there are still kind of some of these old school euthanatoi running around who have most of their magic actually invested in merits. And I thought that was an interesting alternative way to kind of build a character. I probably wouldn't use it as a player, but certainly as an NPC, I think it would be interesting to have a euthanatoi where just all of their dots had gone into supernatural merits rather than into dots of spheres. It goes over a whole bunch of rotes as well as how they actually view the spheres. And one of the ones that I thought was interesting is they make mention that rarely do mages use forces because it is playing with the bonds to the gods as viewed through the classical elements. That it is often not practiced above two dots until you have shed your focus, kind of representing either your mastery or the favor of the elements. And I thought that was flavorful and interesting that the euthanatoi use traditional focuses until they're just going to call down a rain of fire and they're just going to tug on that string that they have to uh, to call in a favor as it were. We have roads like Iron Avatar where you turn into a six-armed, eight-foot-tall killing machine. They talk about the, uh, as Adam said, the geisha uh, or the, uh, the geish, usually spelled uh, G-A-E-S or G-A-E-S-A if it's plural, and that it gives a justification for it that characters can take a mystical ban or compulsion upon themselves because it gives them freebie points to put into something else that uh, when a, a Knight of Radamanthus or a member of Pomegranate Dime takes on charge to do something, the upside of that is now they have more dots to play with. And I like that, that by becoming someone who is oath-sworn, you are getting something in that arrangement. Now, if you break any of these promises they all come crashing down on you and that's a real fast way to die or worse another one they introduce is the idea of persephone's nectar which is a poison but by using correspondence bands baked into it you don't accidentally kill the wrong person and i thought that was very polite i i like <laughs> i like the idea of selective poisons we get a few magical items, one of which, one of the wonders that I really liked was the Torque of Dun, which allows you to swim into the underworld, that in uh, Celtic belief, water was kind of tied to death. And if you've ever been off the west coast of Ireland, you could understand why when you're like, what represents death? I don't know, maybe that massive body of water we can't see across that is constantly pounding against the shores that repeatedly kills our people when they're trying to go fishing. And everyone's like, yep, that represents death. And I thought, also think that's very evocative. If you're familiar with the setting of Wraith, you have the Sea of Shadows uh, and the Weeping Bay surrounding Stygia. And just to have a mage like go into a body of water in the mortal world and then just kind of emerge from the Sea of Shadows wearing this device, I thought was hugely evocative and fascinating in a different view of things. We also get a section of magic specifically dealing with the dead. And this was so good. Because it's just like, here are all the things you could want to do with the dead. Here are the focuses that you might want to use. Here's some of the basic effects. And it also like shows you that necromancy or just like death magic is so big. It's like, oh, are you using it for augury? Are you using it for investigation? Are you doing necrosynthesis to bind the, the enemy, the energy of death to kill someone? Are you using it for, for travel? I wish more 
magical aspects got this level of investigation within the game. But ah, Malcolm Shepard can't write every book. It mentions that you need magic to, in some way, cross the Shroud, that the Shroud otherwise bars you from entering the Underworld. And in the Agama wrote, that is done through potent entropy magics. There are other ways of doing it, or you can have a merit that helps. And we also get rules for visiting the Land of the Dead in the sense of guidelines and recommendations that Euthanatoi follow. They mentioned early in Chapter 2 that uh, either the, the Shade Realm or the Shard Realm of uh, the Sphere of Entropy is under the sole supervision of the Euthanatoi, and specifically uh, Senex, and I, I just don't think that's reasonable. I mean, uh, Shade Realms and Shard Realms are, are very, very big places with a lot of entrances and a lot of exits. It would be like taking a faction of mages and saying, okay, see that see on the map that whole continent of africa yeah that, that's ours uh, no, nobody else can can come in or leave without our say so it's like do you know how many my mi- how many miles of, of border the continent has uh yeah there, there's no mage group that can just say that that's ours and we're going to actually make it stick it doesn't seem reasonable to me page 53 goes into the revised edition trend of well actually it goes against the revised edition trend of blending mages and sorcerers that is uh, sphere magic users and linear magic users. Uh, it, it just says that, no, in, in this tradition, the Thanatos, that doesn't work very well. They, they are separate. There are things that the mages uh, do, the responsibilities that they carry out, and they look at the their sorcerer brothers and sisters and say, no, you're not equipped for this, and you're not going to carry out these responsibilities. And so it made sense. It, it was reasonable. Reading through the section, it's like, I cannot disagree with this. It, it goes against the revised edition trend, but Darn, this sidebar makes sense. I I have to concur. (laughs) Page 54, there is the Jor sidebar. And uh, one of the really interesting things for me was that when this Jor sidebar starts, it separates resonance from intent. And I think most mage fans would agree that resonance is all about the intent of the mage who is is doing the magical effect, and the resonance is a result of that. But this actually tries to, to separate the two, which is... A new idea and uh, maybe very interesting for your chronicles, but it, it's something that a storyteller should actually deliberately think about. It's like, which way am I going to do this? Because there are some reasons to connect intent to resonance. Uh, now, also in that sidebar, they have a, a sort of subheader, Skirting Damnation. And this section is very helpful for storytellers. Uh, I think this this should have been included uh, years ago. There, there's actual... Uh, details about handling the uh, jaw taint, you know, the negative resonance, you know, how you get it, what it is, how you deal with it. It's like, oh my gosh, this is really great. And you know, hats off to the author for this one. I wish we could have seen this back in like early second edition or something. It would have been helpful. The uh, Thanatoic magic section has a nice idea, which, uh, by the way, is an example of group paradigm for the Thanatos, even though officially it's individual paradigms in revised edition. There's still a lot of material talking about group paradigms. But uh, this is the idea in the Thanatoic magic section that uh, when Euthanatos mages serve the universe... This allows them to reach into the primordial being and use powers that uh, are not bound to forms in the Tellurian. It's basically like using raw power of the universe, and they're allowed to do this because they have a special relationship with the forces behind the universe, that is the Great Wheel. I thought that was a really cool idea. I'd really like to play with that in my Chronicles. Um, there's a section on the spheres, and I think that they should have mentioned that Euthanatos, uh, because they have a focus on on fate and uh, trying to determine the future and what that means for the universe, I think this should give them a a better ability to detect recurring phenomena in in the universe that are connected to the time sphere. I would have liked to have seen a mention for that, but I have to admit that was something that was talked about a lot more in first edition and a lot less in later edition, so I guess I can understand why the author did not uh, call this one out. There is a rote called the Iron Avatar that, that Terry mentioned, and yes, this does require a lot of uh, sphere dots. It also requires a lot of people, a lot of time for preparation. It's, it's really clear that this is meant for storytellers to use in story climaxes. This is not something you do at the beginning of the first session of the story you're telling with your group. So that, that I kind of had a chuckle when I looked at that. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I can see that this is for climaxes and not for any other scenes in our games. Just wanted to call out something that for me is, is an interesting uh, difference between the editions of mage in early editions of mage uh, it was clear that when dealing with wraiths or anything regarding the low umbra you had to use a combination of entropy and spirit uh, spheres 
uh, because that whole realm of existence is, is more distant, more removed, more unknown, and less commonly encountered. Uh, here, it, it specifically states that if you're dealing with wraiths, you're just using the spirit sphere. And so this, this backs up what we've seen in other revised edition books, and this marks a, a change that helps me to uh, discuss Mage with a lot of other uh, revised edition fans, who some of whom are, are unaware of how it was handled in earlier editions. But that wraps up my thoughts on Chapter 2. Chapter 3, All Flesh is Ashes. Continuing the, the light and breezy chapter titles that we have. Yeah, that we, one's cheery, isn't it? Yeah, especially. <laughs> we get a character sheet for Evelyn Kinsale. We get a character sheet for Theora Heturk, Herald of Senex, uh, after who is liberated from the House of Helicar, who we are get a bunch of information on in the first tradition book. We get information on Amanda, who is uh, another apprentice of Senex, who was Mercedes in a former life, who is one half of the opening fiction to the 2E core rulebook. Uh, we get some information on Vormos, Grand Harvest, Harvester of Souls, as well as Senex. So Evelyn is the character we've been following. Theora is introduced. Uh, Truce is another. One of the greatest pairs of background characters in Mage are Senex, the old man who is notable for a couple reasons. One, uh, they seem to be one of the few masters or archmasters active after the Avatar Storm. And it, this book thoroughly bucks the trend of only the kids know what's right in the universe. And in this case, it's the exact opposite. It's a 500-year-old guy who's like, I got a plan. And the kids are like, your plan's stupid. And depending on how the Ascension <laughs> conflict plays out, you'll know. Vormos, Grand Harvester of Souls, is this insane, jor obsessed archmaster who's been obsessed with death for centuries and is trying to avoid the karmic repercussions of what they've done over the course of centuries and we think is trying to annihilate the universe possibly which is kind of a, a big push hubris if uh, if anything but it also makes a side of uh, note where it's like yeah this person's been hanging out with uh, this the Southeast Asian death god a lot I wonder what's I wonder what's up there so uh, if you're curious how that turns out, continue listening through to January of 2022 when Adam and I finally get around to talking about Ascension as a book. That's going to be a heck of an episode. Uh, we also get information on all Youth Anatoly Chronicles that some of the things that they need to balance as a group is that they have a sacred duty to uphold. They need to make sure that their punishments fit the crime, that on a more investigatory bend, that they can try and investigate the causes of the reckoning that investigate the week of nightmares. They were a group that was very much affected by it, that they're trying to do some big ass stuff to rearrange the cosmos. And that's neat because it gives us one of the few epic storylines of revised so far. A lot of the, the, the things have been uh, small and intimate in here it kind of zooms out to say there's also a universe that's hanging in the balance there's an aside where it mentions that they distrust mortals with capital punishment and i very much appreciated this section because it's like how would you trust anyone who doesn't have the tools of magic to investigate a crime or to poke into someone's reasoning with the mind sphere before you would kill them and this is an issue that defies the euthanatos and i like any time where the awakened and mortal view of something could very much be different we get the group political triage international who fights unjust regimes it is referred to within the text as the red cross with teeth and it sets this very successful cabal up as an entrance to hubris. And the author spells it out that this group has gone from success to success. And eventually someone's going to have a problem with that. Either the technocracy is going to be annoyed by a, an awakened group who is muddling in mortal political affairs, or a mortal group is not going to want this organization coming in and messing with whatever conflict they have and to have a group specifically introduced as a group that could fall that a group that could fail i think is interesting because most of the other cabals we get are either uh, set pieces or alternatively groups that the characters could theoretically become the leader of and turn around and i liked this different take we get the legend section where they talk about hey there are these avatar shards possibly that may be recoalescing into something huge that has been discussed before is that a thing they talk about the river of wisdom and death that if avoided will allow you to maintain your memories before being reborn we have the traditional river lethe that causes forgetfulness that water could be quite useful in that could it cause someone to forget that they are awakened and likewise could the river of memory be something that could uh, restore lost information within the game and are they out there we get a whole bunch of templates and 
I thought the choices between what the character's abilities are, what the character's backgrounds are, and what the character's concepts are, are kind of interesting. The only thing that comes to mind when I look through here is that a bunch of groups have someone that in some way is investigating the nature of paradox. And in this, we have the student of paradox. And I wish the game had some way of expressing people being good at paradox, for lack of a better term. Uh, characters that are particularly skilled at controlling backlashes or dealing with its manifestations or skilled with rolling with a paradox flaw or something like that. That's probably a bit too in the weeds plot-wise within the story. The judgment of Janine is occurs, I will not spoil that for you, as well as the character Truce being revealed to having things lurking beneath their, uh, this character having been kind of Jor eaten possibly and possibly being on the road to recovery from that and on page 75 they mention a weakness of this tradition they are focused on rehabilitation through reincarnation and they have had that focus for so long that they have a very difficult time with m more modern methods of, of rehabilitating people who have problems and i i thought that was was very insightful and uh uh, very, very clever. That's something I could use as a storyteller. The Mysteries of Fate on page 76 hints at something I'd like to see more of. That is the Euthanatos watching the whole world and trends that run through the whole universe rather than, than individuals. Uh, I, I really liked that. I'm, I'm glad to see that in the book. It, it's just uh, kind of a shame that it was such a small part of, of a larger book, but um, I really liked seeing that. That's something that I would seize on. Uh, however, I, I realize a lot of other people might not be as interested in that. The, the sample cabal, I actually was not so sure what to think about them. They, they basically say we kill a lot of people. Uh, we, we look at what's going on in the news, and then we head out to that country that's having uh, instability, and we choose a side. And we, we totally uh, push that uh, through very violent military means. Um, it, it spells out that uh, this sample cabal really does believe that the ends justify the means. And uh, as, as a storyteller, if I was going to use them in, in any story I was presenting my players to, I would have to use this group as a villain, uh, as villains, they, they certainly look like villains to me, but I, I don't think the author intended them to be seen that way. But um, that's, I gotta say that that is my take on it. In the legends section, uh, we only get two legends. I usually like to, to get some more legends. I really enjoy those sections of the revised edition uh, tradition books, but they have the legend of Rudra, the, the Vedic archer, um, sort of, sort of a, a god, I guess you could say, in Vedic tradition. And I, I just thought that legend was so cool. I, I was like reading that going, damn, I love this. Uh, let me explain why. In the original Euthanatos, when Mage first came out, early first edition, 1993, uh, they were a, a very mysterious, uh, feared, controversial group. They were up to no good in the shadows and no, no one outside of the tradition could quite agree uh, what it was. And uh, as we got into second edition, the, the group was redefined. I actually call them original Euthanatos and modern Euthanatos. And the modern Euthanatos was, was a much more um, uh, moral, heroic, uh, agreeable group of people. But here in this legend of Rudra, uh, Malcolm Shepard takes those original uh, early first edition rumors and he just dives headfirst into it, which I thought was so cool because uh, ever since the this tradition got its transformation in second edition, it, it seems to be like there's some unwritten agreement among the mage authors that, yeah, let's not mention anything that came before. And Malcolm Shepard is like, screw it. That's some cool <laughs> stuff. I'm diving head first in. Yes, we, we've, there's uh, legends that Senex and uh, Vormas, the Grand Harvester, and other unnamed important leaders in this tradition are secretly uh, shepherding souls through different uh, lives and, and rebirths. Uh, and they're trying to, to build some ultimate leader or group of leaders, and they're going to shake up the whole world with it, and they're hoping nobody discovers it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so awesome. I, so hats off to Malcolm Shepard for not being afraid to, to dive into some of that material from earlier books. And finally, um, the, the templates at the end, sort of uh, uh, no-name uh, example characters that you might play with. A lot of revised edition tradition books try to use this section to say, hey, members of this group are such a great variety, they're all over the map, and there, there's nothing defining them or pushing them into a box. And I think that's a little too open. Now, here in this book, the templates, uh, every template in here relates well to concepts uh, earlier in the book. It was very intelligently done, very reasonably done. There's one template in here that, that takes some basic concepts from this book and just reverses it. 
and says, well, what if what if you did things totally different? Here's an example of that. But but again, every template is tied to what this book is talking about and what this book is focusing on. And so I thought it was very intelligent and very helpful for people who want to use the material in this book. So again, hats off to the author for that one. Very very well, uh, very good use of the templates that I think a lot of times are just squandered. But uh, that wraps up my thoughts on chapter three. So what do you think about the book overall? There's a lot packed into this book. I was joking at the beginning of this episode, there's a lot of meat on this bone. And, you know, joking aside, with the small type used in this book, the 100 pages give us a lot more than 100 pages. So, uh, yeah, there's there's certainly a lot to talk about. I just wanted to throw out uh, the good death is, is uh, you, with capital letters, has been a term associated with the Euthanatos ever since the beginning of um, the first mage book that was published. And my understanding of that term is uh, it means... Uh, A horrible murder that isn't horrible if you really understand what's going on. I I think that's basically the concept here. It's like you see some person get whacked in a back alley. It's like, oh my gosh, that that poor girl was murdered. And then you find, oh, no, actually, you know, there was all this stuff I didn't know about. And when I see this death in context, I see that it was actually a necessary adjustment to the universe. And so I really feel like moral ambiguity has been baked into the Euthanatos ever since their initial conception in the first mage book. And I thought that it was a bit of a disservice to this idea to say in this book, just as in the first tradition book, hey, we Euthanatos, um, we have a reputation for assassinating people, but we only kill serial killers. So, you know, it's not that controversial, really. I mean, yeah, we're killing people, I guess that's bad, but we're only killing people that everyone agrees are the very worst humanity has to offer, regardless of your cultural uh, upbringing. And so I think that that takes a lot of wind out of the sails. It kind of takes the moral ambiguity away. Yes, we're killing people, but everyone agrees they're really bad people, so let's just agree that this is not so bad. And so I, I like having that, you know, that stirring controversy and that... Um, discussion about uh, moral ideas there in in the Thanatos. I think in this book, uh, Hindu ideals or or some ideas that are in Hinduism about uh, life and death and rebirth and how that causes a cycle to the universe, I think this idea gets really heavily smuggled into the Greek, Sub-Saharan, African, and, and Celtic cultures. And so I, th- I think there was some, a lot of kind of sleight of hand here to make these other cultures adjust to the, uh, one of the cultural groups in the Indian subcontinent. And so I think it was artfully done, and I think it helps tie this tradition together in a way that we have never seen in previously published books. But at the same time, I feel like the, the Greek, Celtic, and African cultures are kind of getting pushed into a mold and not allowed to kind of breathe and develop on their own. And so that's something that that I was noticing as I was reading through the book. Also, this book represents the idea that mages who serve the wheel recognized each other as they made contact over the centuries. And I can see how they recognized each other as underdogs and people who focused on death, but I have a harder time seeing the wheel outside of the Indian subcontinent. And so, yeah, I, I kept noticing that as I read the book. Malcolm Shepard's gift to us as mage fans is an informed consideration of the entire world of darkness. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, great uh, authors writing for mage, but I really feel like a lot of them knew mage well and didn't know the other games in the world of darkness so well. And Malcolm Shepard really knows the whole world of darkness. And so as he's writing, he is able to skillfully connect threads out to the Nagaraja bloodline of vampires and and other groups in other games where it makes sense, where it's appropriate. And so he's able to present to us a a complete uh, Euthanatos-focused world of darkness package that was just so entertaining to read. I, I it's like one of those things, uh, it would be kind of ignorant to say, I wish all the authors did this, because th- that takes a lot of knowledge and, and time reading that is not reasonable to push on every author. But Malcolm Shepard has the skills, and we love to see it. So I'm going to call that out. This did a much better job of explaining the Euthanatos idea of how they have a duty to the universe. This has always been a, a concept for the Euthanatos. It's been mentioned in, in previous books but here it was explained very well. It, it helped me know how to uh, use this as a uh, storyteller. And it also helped me to see how it makes sense to the degree that I would want to use it as a storyteller. So I appreciate that. The first tradition book uh, was published in second edition of Mage. 
and it kind of had this idea that all these different cultures of the Euthanatos hang together because they recognize that they're all death mages, and that's enough to link us together. And, and I, I, I didn't see it. It's like, no, I don't think that's enough to link them together. This book did link them together. It helped me to see that. Also, the, the first tradition book had this sort of sentimental idea that uh, because we obsess on death, that helps us appreciate life better. And, and so you should, you should think that we're great guys because of that. And it, it just didn't stick the landing for me. I was reading through the first tradition book thinking, I'm, I'm, I know you want me to understand this, but it's not clicking for me. Uh, but for this book, in, instead of death reminds us of life, the, the theme was um, the wheel is a concept that can be understood by different cultures and different points of view, and that brings us together. And yes, that helps me as a storyteller. Now I can see these different cultures clinging together better and, and working together. So, so thank you so much for that. I guess the last point I would bring up is uh, they have a very interesting plot idea in, in this book, which has been mentioned in previous books, and that is the Euthanatos are the best people to be a sort of uh, police force for the traditions, to call out rogue individuals and rogue groups that are working against the uh, traditions secretly and eliminating those groups and thus protecting all mages who are part of the Council of Nine. I can see how that's a good plot point. I can see how that would be a fun thing to work with, you know, council politics in, in your chronicle. Uh, but I've got to say that uh, regardless of whether uh, it's revised edition or the previous editions, uh, I see so many examples of how the Euthanatos did not do a good job of policing their own group. And so wanting to go out to you know the larger council of nine and saying we got such a good track record why don't we do it for you i can see other council mages saying oh i don't think you have a very good track record and i'm not sure i want you doing that for me and also the euthanatos were doing this secretly without telling anyone and so something happened where it was forced out into the open and so the euthanatos are like well yeah we were trying to keep that secret but uh, now that it's out in the open don't you agree we good we did a good job of it and don't you think we should keep doing it and it's like and, and again my point of view as an outsider is look, you were doing all this stuff that affected me and you were keeping it a secret from me. So doesn't that mean I should have a hard time trusting you? And so now that it's out in the open, you're asking me to trust you more. Well, I think I have a reason not to trust you. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I don't want to say, oh, it's so stupid to say that Euthanatos should be a police force because I think that can lead to a lot of interesting uh, ideas for your chronicle. It's just that I can see both sides of this issue. Yeah, there's only one person we failed to track down. That person is possibly capable of destroying the Tellurian as we know it. But still, numerically, there's only one guy we haven't been able to track down. <laughs> so, my guess as to how fate mages and so on identified each other is resonance. Like, that's the closest guess I have. Like, when they talk about... Oh, at the the gathering of the Council of the Nine or the Grand Convocation, these groups were able to identify each other. Like that's my guess, I think. Or it, it, I guess one of the weird things that you get as part of the Euthanatoi is the whole like fate thing, where like they knew it was going to happen because they knew it was going to happen. Which which to me is a real big sellout. Malcolm's allowed to do it. <laughs> like, like, like you're just saying that because he's your favorite. Yes. Yes, I am. I, not until you had mentioned the smaller typeface did I realize that this tradition book is 17,000 words longer than most of the other ones. Like Order of Hermes is a little bit on the fat side. This is like, this one's roughly 78,000 words. The next longest one in revised is 70,000 words. And then most of the other ones are between 60 and 65,000 words. So uh, this is, this is a chunker. This, this boy gets two seats on the bus. Overall, I liked the aesthetic. I liked the fact that it made, that they brought back Alex Shakeman as one of the original artists from the one book. Uh, the Dream Speaker book did this. The Celestial Chorus book did this too. Um, I, I appreciated bringing back those similar visual motifs. Uh, Alex Shakeman's very stark black and white style, I think, befits it. And I think if like Langdon Foss or Jeff Lobenstein had done this, I think that would have been a very different book. But then again, it's revised. So we only get like nine illustrations throughout the entire thing so that there's more space for dense prose. I like the fact that Malcolm 
populates the world with groups doing things that are doing things to other groups. Like a lot of mage books are kind of written with this hands-off approach where the author is uncomfortable positing that there is this group doing this thing in this area and it kind of maintains this very wishy-washy view of things. But even in the section where the author is laying out, oh yeah, here are some active cabals around the world. They all exist in the world rather than making it like a rumor that is often used in another book or it being a a placeless or a faceless group of people that may or may not be doing something uh, is willing to make the world seem alive. And I, I very much appreciate that kind of writing. I think this book along with orphan survival guide actually did some of the best jobs of depicting magic. The characters talk about the weird tingling that they get at the base of the neck or the feeling they have as the strings of fate are being modified. It kind of reminds you that in character it is not necessarily a character obviously creating an effect that it's these subtle manipulations that a character isn't quite sure how they work but just knows that they do over time they have a worldview that kind of enforces it but there's nothing there's no the character doesn't know that they're making in a retail role and i thought this book did a good job of presenting magic in that much more subtle light that if you were actually a magic user in the game you wouldn't necessarily know what's going on in the same way that you would uh, as a player overall this is probably my favorite tradition book that we get in revised so far i very much enjoyed the one eu thanatos book also because it did a great job of advancing the meta plot of the game and making the world feel alive i have no difficulty recommending someone who has a eu thanatos character in their game grabbing this I, I don't think the revised meta plot changes too much uh, maybe Senex trying to defend reality is not so front and center but i think it's great to use the technical term well i did have a few adventure ideas yeah. that i wanted to share i was trying to uh, uh, incorporate the the themes of this book into it and i'll let the listeners decide if i succeeded in that or not but uh, here we go with some uh, story ideas for you. Uh, number one, the Euthanatos players in the Cabal are called to a private meeting with the Golden Chalice and Scholars of the Wheel. An emergency has arisen, and if the Euthanatos players can convince their seniors that their Cabal mates can be trusted, the players are sent to the Mexican state of Oaxaca and told not to offend the people they meet there. A mage claiming to represent the Yum Simil meets them in the jungle. The Mayan god has spoken. The time of secrecy is over. The players are told the Avatar Storm was the precursor of the alignment of the shard realms that will soon occur. Players are directed to meditate at three nodes hidden deep in the jungles of Central America to become sacred conductors. They will then take holy writings to Euthanatos' leadership. This is a rare opportunity to be at the center of the reintegration of the Yum Simil back into the Euthanatos. However, is that worth the players risking their skins visiting nodes held by hostile were creatures? This could be an opportunity to give the Storm Warden merit to your players and open the door to journeys among the shard realms. Number two, rumors of the Euthanatos dark designs have swirled through the Council of Nine for centuries, but few listened. Now members of the House of Helicar who were announced dead are active. Senex has disappeared and his apprentices are removing Euthanatos chantry leaders. The new representative for the Euthanatos is frantic to keep the turmoil hidden from the other traditions. Euthanatos members of the Players' Cabal will be tapped to help track down the rogue assassins. The players learn that Natatapas, Scholars of the Wheel, and Golden Chalice are working to bring to life a dark messiah spoken of in the ancient book, The Ocean of Dust. The Knights of Radamanthus are working hard to oppose the conspiracy. The Knights ask the players to defend a Euthanatos chantry that is an ancient Hindu temple on Penang Island in Malaysia. An obelisk with carvings on it called the Shield of Kalki stands in a cave beneath the chantry. The players will have to deal with political chaos in the surrounding city as well as determined Golden Chalice assassins. The prophecy on the obelisk holds the key to unravel the conspiracy's secrets, but can the players hold out that long? Number three. After years of distrust, the Avatar Storm has shaken up the tra traditions enough to grant a new start. The Albareo are working hard to establish a network of trusted Euthanatos to serve as a police force for the Earthbound Council of Nine. Convincing the overworked new leaders of the other traditions is the hardest part. The Euthanatos player characters are asked to talk their cabal into serving as guides and bodyguards for newly appointed heralds. Heralds are diplomats that travel between chantries for the Council of Nine. As they help the heralds travel, they will watch for danger and speak well of the Albareo's goals. Attacks on heralds by unstable sendings, uh, spirit messengers from the Umbra, are on the rise. Can the players find the cause? 
This scenario is a great way to integrate your players into awakened politics while providing enough action to keep everyone interested. So those are my three story ideas. Hopefully those will inspire some ideas of your own. Terry has these great quotes at the end of the episodes, and I'm never going to match his caliber, but there was one quote in this book that just jumped off the page to me. I'm, I'm just, I just got to repeat it. Uh, in chapter three, quote, A violent yet compassionate cabal, the political triage international combines healing and killing in one efficient, world-spanning organization, end quote. I just couldn't help but notice that. But uh, does that also describe the technocracy? I'm, I'm not sure. I was going to say it described my dating in my late 20s, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hmm, this is a little close to home here, Mr. Mr. Shepard. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I do like the idea of this buddy cop thing where the technocracy and political trias international are like fighting with each other, and there's just a moment where it's like, I just can't quit you, and they just like make out or something like that. That's my 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 mage citizens and fanfic. Uh, follow me on archive of your own. I, I thought this book was strewn with some pretty great notes. I already indicated uh, one of my favorite ones, where Malcolm talks about death being the necessary thing that draws entropy away from balance and towards decay. One of the segments was talking about later, though, was talking about their view of the other traditions and their skepticism at their at the celestial chorus's willingness to say all good things come from the one but all bad things come from somewhere else and in reply the person says when i was a boy i used to marvel at how the crops drank up the sun to go strong and straight when i was a boy i cried at the sun withering our fields when it grew too powerful yet it was the same sun ascribing all of the good to one entity and all the evil to another cannot describe god in full any more than half a wheel can move a cart or half a sun can grow a crop and my favorite line from Malcolm was at the end where it says where there's the idiot disclaimer and it specifically says you see the anti-idiot disclaimer on a lot of white wolf products this isn't an indication of the number of idiots in the world so much as the fact that a lone idiot can do a lot of damage <laughs> we hear you Malcolm <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's all for me what are we reading next uh, next up uh, the tradition book hollow one and are the hollow ones a tradition at all we'll discuss that in the next episode you want to take us out well, if you have uh, something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review of Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in their web searches. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there, see the order in which they came out, and see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. Well, this episode is thanks to executive producers Joshua Golden, John Magnuson, Ira Grace, Richard Bat Brewster, Michael Parker, Christopher Phillips, Lara J. Sunsern, Bryce Perry, William Martin, John Horton, William Connolly, Brendan Morrill, Andrew Kotz, Jenna F., Andrew Edelstein, Chris Zack, Anders, and Justin. If you would like to become an executive producer for Major the Podcast, it would help us keep producing episodes like this one and you could become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link is in the show notes, and it will get you started. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening, and until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Bye.